Hi, Christine. <laughs> Hi, um, I miss you. <laughs> I miss you too. This this week, I actually um, I had like a really down day where I was like. Oh, I wish like I could just go drive over to Christine's and like not down for any reason except for the fact that I miss you. I was just like, oh. I was like, oh, I wish I could <laughs> pop on over. But and the saddest part is even before I moved, it was still that way because of Corona. So it wasn't like anything has changed. It's just been months of unending sadness. And That's loneliness. exactly what we're going to call this in the history books. Yes. <laughs> um, but no, I just I just I don't know why. Maybe it's just like the third month is the one that hit me where I was like, oh, you're just never. You're not nearby, so. Just gone forever. Mm -hmm. Well, I am never gone, really, because I do constantly uh, barrage you with text messages, and I never quite leave you alone. So don't worry. I'm not quite gone. I thought you were going to – I thought this was the moment we were going to be like, oh, well, I'm never really gone because I'm here. And (laughs) just, like, waltz through the door. (laughs) (laughs) I already did that. We already pulled that. I already pulled that trick, and it worked amazingly. Um, What? Hello. Why are you drinking today, Em? Oh, well, I'm drinking because I miss you, I think. Oh, I guess that's that's what I was looking for. I was just fishing for that exact answer. So. <laughs> uh, no, I, I think that's probably it. Other than that, I nothing else is really going on. <laughs> I don't well, have a good week. Oh, good. Okay, well, that's good news. I'm glad I'm the only dark spot, dark cloud on your horizon, that I is, guess. You're my, you're my, my bald spot on my head. <laughs> um, why do you drink? Well, okay, I do have a slight uh, house update. Which I was about to read and then my like Google Home thing started talking to me and I was like, oh, no, it knows. Um, But so a couple people have mentioned like, oh, I think I know what is going on in your house. It must just be the house settling. And I first of all, I know that's like the classic unsettling. That's unsettling. Unsettling. (laughs) The house is unsettling in my presence and I don't like it. (laughs) Um, And so obviously that was my first thought, too, because I'm like, okay, it's a new house. It's old. Um, but a, I've lived in old houses my whole life. Like I know creeks and stuff aren't anything spooky, but it's, it's the other stuff that's throwing me off. Like that feeling of being watched. And the other thing that I think I didn't mention last week for some reason that's also started happening is that I'll hear, okay, now I'm really scared. I don't even want to hear the end of the sentence. What, what do you hear? (laughs) Chanting? Latin. No. What? You're you're waiting for the day when I hear Eke Romane playing. I'm waiting the, for the day the where bathroom. we pop on to Zoom together to record an episode and you're speaking Latin. Oh. <laughs> My <laughs> eyes are like upside down. Uh, <laughs> Your eyes are upside down? I don't know. That's, that's how I picture possession. I don't know. What a, that's like more disturbing than like what other people think of just <laughs> only your eyes <laughs> listen i'm home alone a lot i have a lot to think about uh, okay anyway i'm sorry by myself you hear something so i hear um this like talking and whispering noises and it's i live in like a empty house i mean not empty but like it's just us and i live in a really quiet neighborhood for the first time ever like i lived in la before which was not quiet ever um, and I keep hearing like what sounds like whispered conversation, like two people talking and I'll, okay. I'll go around the corner and it'll just like stop. Like, it's not like it's, oh, it's coming from outside or it's coming from a different spot. It'll just kind of <sighs> stop. And this has like, since I talked about this on a recent, I think it was two episodes ago. Um, it's kind of slowed down the whole, the whole feeling, but the whispering has happened a couple more times, which reminded me to bring it up. Um, oh and it God. sounds like the same voice every time. Like, so I don't know if I'm going crazy. I don't know what's going on, but it's, uh, unsettling. I and, hate it. I hate yeah. that. Do you know if they're whispering? Do you know, do you know at all what they're saying in the whispers or is it just murmuring? No, I hear like, it's murmuring. That's the exact word. It's murmuring. And I will like be really quiet and, and it'll keep going. And then the second I move or like turn, it'll stop. And it doesn't sound like anything in particular like it doesn't sound like um words that I can make out but it does sound it does sound like English as far as I can tell but um I don't know and I people keep being like pull out the Ouija board and I'm like not alone man I have to wait for him to get here no Uh, you will not you will (laughs) literally I will not do that you know what honestly at this point sure let's do it in your house that's now on the other side of the country now I'll now, all of a sudden, I'll whip out a Ouija board because it's not going to mess with me. <laughs> okay, fair. I mean, maybe it, some people have also said maybe it's Walt, which maybe it is Walt, but 
Why if is it Walt is, more active all of a sudden? Then? Because right. And like, it's not the ways he used to like the, the seeing that things out of the corner of our eye that Walt used to do that. But the whispering that has never happened before. So I don't know. I've that. seen, I've seen Walt and felt Walt. I've never heard Walt and I don't no, want same. to. I do Me not neither. want to. <laughs> I do not want. No, you, you were a gentleman, <laughs> Walt, when you were a silent man. Um, <laughs> Drink okay. your gin and stay quiet. Just stay in, by the whiskey cart. You'll be okay. <laughs> so I don't know. I mean, I'll keep you updated. It really has stopped a lot since I talked about it on that episode. Um, so I don't know what's going on, but I just wanted to update you because I had forgotten to mention that. Um, so that's your update for the day. What a! It's more like a down date, but <laughs> I appreciate it. I do really like this information being so far away in proximity See, to me. Doesn't that make you feel better that I'm far away now? Yes. Now, <laughs> all of a sudden, I do not miss you. Please don't bring anything with you next time. Um, okay. I have one more note before you start oh, your oh, 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 go story. Ahead. And it's just that I, uh, for Patreon, I posted the video of Em and Eva surprising me the day of my move um, mm. to Patreon. And you can see what Em and Eva delivered to me uh, for our road trip. And it's really sweet. I was like going through footage for my own YouTube because I'm doing like a road trip video. And I found out the footage of Em and Eva coming. Like I just walked outside and they surprised me and they had all these <laughs> little gifts and stuff for the dog and the cat. And it was really cute. So I posted that to Patreon. Um, so if you are on Patreon, you can log in and see that there. That um, was fun. Yeah. You, you know, since since you've been gone, Eva and I have been able to conspire more often without you nearby, which has been fun. Well, so, somehow Eva and I have also been able to conspire and fly me across country. So fair, we're both actually. in in a new level, a new a new level of uh, maybe Eva's people. just taking like a breath. She's like, okay, I can handle both of you f- like at an arm's reach in now. Different like, time. You're not <laughs> smothering me. Yeah, I mean, like it has been nice. Like I've gone over to her place and we were able to Facetime you. That was fun. Oh, that was cute. I loved that experience. That was that precious. Was and then, yeah. uh, uh, I mean, I remember that day when we got you all those presents uh, she she was the one who suggested doing stuff for the pets too she was like oh we should get stuff for the so cats and cute she got a cat sack where you're supposed to carry <laughs> she showed me that on the way and i was like good luck like presenting that to christine and Putting as a good Juniper idea <laughs> in a sack <laughs> i was like this is not gonna go well but anyway it's super cute and that was really sweet of them and um that is on patreon now so just a just an fyi cool coolio I, all right. Uh, now that's all my notes, Em. It's all it's all you now. Oh, well, I have a question. How is, did we ever put up the space camp video? Oh no, that one is still taking me. <laughs> it's forty five separate videos that I'm attempting to um, <laughs> put in one, which is why I keep uploading short things to Patreon because that's, the the space camp one is the one I cannot wait for because I that know. was just a day of fucking chaos. And the thing with the le- lemon napping video that's on Patreon took like also months or like at least four weeks. Um, and so this but it one was at least that, one video. Yeah, that one was six videos. This one's 42. Oh. <laughs> um, so I'm just giving you kind of a, like an S like a reason for why it's delayed, but uh, I know when it shows up, it'll be amazing. I just want, I just want to so. talk about, I just want to like be able to finally talk about my favorite part of the space camp or have we already talked about it on the show? Is before? it, you know who? Oh, I know. You know who I know who. Yes. Her Frappuccino. Yes. <laughs> Oh my God. No, there's nothing I want to talk about more forever. So you're right. Okay, Maybe well, that'll give day. me the boost. That'll give me the the kick in the ass I need to get started. <laughs> Do it for the Frappuccino <laughs> character we, we can't talk about yet. So I remember the day I discovered Glossier M. I think it was when we were in New York uh, for the Webbies. And mm. ever since I've been deeply obsessed. Uh, so Glossier, you, you guys probably know them for popularizing this like glowy, dewy skin look, you know, very dewy. moisturized, yes. very dewy. Mm-hmm. Um, but they make skincare, makeup, body care and fragrance products, all of which I love, by the way. Um, I know M has been complimenting how beautiful I am. I lately. have. If you've been on our Instagram lives lately or um, even I mean, we've been zooming wow. every single uh recording we've been doing and every time i'm like what the fuck have you been doing with your face like what yeah. have you been doing with your makeup what have you been doing with You're your welcome. eyes also You're welcome. you have been sending me and eva pictures lately 
and every single like a real nut job yeah <laughs> every single one of those pictures i'm like christine who gave you the right to look <laughs> that dewy what is going on <laughs> i appreciate all that you're saying because i know it's really painful for you to compliment me so uh but it is true that i've been using glossier like only regularly for like weeks now maybe even months um they have this like priming moisturizer i have like very dry skin naturally and so they have this like moisture rich primer i mean honestly i feel like my skin uh, morning and night now. I'm finally taking good care of it. Um, and they have makeup too. So like, you know, if I want to look good for M and the Instagram live, I could just uh -huh. put on, put on a little, like a little blush for um, me or for the other, paint. just trying to like outshine me is really what you're doing. I see. Also, they have uh, several cool products called future do invisible shield and bubble wrap, which is my personal favorite. Cause it's a hydrating eye and lip cream that creates an extra layer of protective cushion. So you can handle your skin's most fragile areas with extra care. And honestly, the name alone is why it's my favorite. Get the glowy dewy look for yourself by visiting glossier.com slash podcast slash drink. Plus all new customers get 10% off their first order at glossier.com slash podcast slash drink. Certain exclusions apply. That's glossier, G-L-O-S-S-I-E-R.com slash podcast slash drink. Em, mm -hmm. I know both of us are stressed and we probably have some muscle ouchies sometimes. Muscle ouchies is exactly <laughs> what me, the athlete, says. <laughs> <laughs> okay. To be fair, neither of us are elite athletes, even though we try to pretend. Uh, we're just regular people trying to get through our day, but muscle pain and muscle tension are very real, unfortunately. And luckily for us, we have Theragun. It's the handheld percussive therapy device that releases your deepest muscle tension using a scientifically calibrated combination of depth, speed, and power. And now it's as quiet as an electric toothbrush which is, by the way, I can attest to, um, we, so we use ours all the time in our apartment, especially like, again, me, the athlete, there's nothing <laughs> I love more than being massaged down by my Theragun after doing nothing at all. Nothing all day. <laughs> <laughs> but there's quite a range in my apartment because it's me and then also like someone training for the Olympics and all of us love. Like literally. Yeah. Li all of us love it. He actually had a different, uh, a different version of this, or I guess maybe an earlier version from a different company. And since we got our Theragun has scrapped it. it has been like, this one is so much nicer. It's quiet. Apparently the last one sounded like a power drill. I mean, <laughs> we're, it's wild. It's so, it's so useful and wonderful and delightful. And it's amazing. It's one of those items where I'm like, how did I function in life before this? I don't remember. And I don't know how. Um, and the so the new one, the all new Gen 4 Theragun has a proprietary brushless motor, which is why it's so quiet. Mm. Uh, you will wonder if it is even on, which happened to me the first time. Uh, <laughs> just saying while you soothe your aching muscles with their gun signature power amplitude and effectiveness I listen, we can't say nice enough things about this this wonderful machine. Try Theragun risk-free for 30 days. There's no substitute for the Theragun Gen 4 with an OLED screen, personalized Theragun app, and the quiet and power that you need. Starting at only $199, go to theragun.com slash drink right now and get your Gen 4 Theragun today. That's theragun.com slash drink. Theragun.com slash drink. drink. Uh, welcome to our paranormal true crime show. Um, I have a ghost story for you as that is hey. my literal job to provide. So this is, uh, going to be fun for people because most of the information I found. So this is, this was a story that was requested a lot. I actually thought I'd already done it. So I kept telling people like, no, I'm not going to cover it. <laughs> and oh, then no. I, and then I found out that I hadn't covered it. Um, and then there wasn't a lot of information online. So most of this information is from ghost adventures. <gasps> Ooh, some everyone's, GA action, some ZB. Everyone's favorite. So ZB from the GA. Yeah. So, um, everyone's favorite except mine. Well, I think maybe it's your extra favorite. Okay. Well, let's not go there. <laughs> so, uh, yes. So this is basically written by Zach Bagans and yours truly. So, <clears throat> this is the story dream, of the, dream collab, by the way. Can you imagine one day I have it in my heart at some point we're going to have to like network with him and he's just going to shit over shit all over whatever idea we have. He's out of going to hand hatred us, for <laughs> he's going to hand us a notarized letter from his lawyer that says you I am suing you for everything you own. And I'm waiting for that. I thought you were going to say. I thought you were going to say he he's going to hand us our asses, which is also true. <laughs> also that, both at the same time. <laughs> I Which is sad because I kind of want to be friends with Zach Bagans after all we've been through together that he doesn't know about. <laughs> yeah, same. Um, 
Anyway, maybe he'll have it in his heart to forgive one day. That's all. Um, Hope. So this is the story of the uh, Island of the Dolls. <gasps> oh, I've been waiting for this one. So I thought this was Pavalia Island. Right. And I don't know why I thought they were the same thing, but I assumed because I had covered Pavalia and that was a Ghost Adventures episode too. Right. I think I just mixed them up. So I kept telling everyone I'd covered it when I hadn't. I remember when you covered that and I, I was waiting the entire time for the dolls to show up and then they didn't. So now, okay. I, yeah. So I think we maybe, had similar thoughts. Maybe it's some sort of like like weird uh, glitch in the matrix thing. Maybe. Or maybe it's just two haunted islands and we got them mixed up. So Or maybe it's just okay. two idiots who don't know what we're talking about. <laughs> So Where? Uh, this is the Island of the Dolls, also known as, oh, I was going to try to say it in Spanish, and I remembered I don't speak Spanish. L- oh, la Isla de las M- Munecas. Okay. Goodbye. I'm just um, so silent. Anyone who speaks Spanish, please don't come at me. I'm aware of how terrible that was. So in this is apparently in the channels of Xochimeco. Um, which is south of the um, south of Mexico City, um, and apparently the island is in a chinempa, chine- chinempa, which is apparently uh, like an area of land surrounded by a lake. So it's like just several channels, and it happens to be on one property, like one of the little chunks of land surrounded by all this water. Okay, does that make sense? Okay, um, <clears throat> so on the it's on the Laguna de Tushuilo. This is literally why I haven't fucking covered this story. Because <laughs> it's, why. I, it's all this, making sense. This is so. Uh, basically, so basically, there are these channels, and on these different uh, chunks of land throughout the, the water channels that you're rowing through, or I think they even have like a ferry or a motorboat that you can go through if you're doing like a tourist attraction version of it. Um, different sites have different attractions. Basically, so okay. there's one uh, land like when you like dock your boat, you can get off and you can see like a play or something oh. like that. Um, one of them happens to be like the the abandoned island of the dolls is Got what it. I'm trying to get out here in English. Okay. <laughs> um, I follow now. So yes, uh, so there are other spots. Uh, the other spots are one's a museum. Uh, the play is the play that I was talking about is actually the La Llorona play. It's about oh. like the and I covered uh I covered La Llorona in episode 92. Fun fact if you want to go listen to what that story is about. Um but so the only access is through the waters. So most people row or are at least willing to transport people on their own boats personally. Um, but when it comes to the actual Island of the Dolls, so many people like refuse to row tourists there because they're so superstitious about what's going on there. Oh, okay. Um, but if you're lucky, you I think they actually do a tour now that will take you there during like Halloween. I think during like the the week of like the Day of the Dead celebrations. Right. Um, I think they do a tourist attraction to that island. But other than that, I think you kind of just have to know somebody who's willing to take you. Or um, be Zach Bagans. <clears throat> Or be Zach Bagans, exactly. Yes. Um, another reason why I wish we were friends with him so we could have those connections. You understand what I'm saying? I um, understand, actually. And now I actually am kind of on the same boat as you. Uh, I know. It was bad, then, though. Let's let's not address it. We have to be careful in the future because what if he pretends that he's friends with us so we can make connections like that and be like, can you send us to the Island of the Dolls? And then he'll pay people a million dollars to never bring us back. I don't think he's going to have to pay anyone a million dollars to leave us somewhere, <laughs> to be honest with you. I don't think he's going to have People to pay very much. People just fucking tweet him. <laughs> so, um, so the Island of the Dolls has been featured in articles um, in the Huffington Post. Uh, it's also been on the Travel Channel, ABC News. A lot of places have covered it. Um, and it's the world's largest, according to Guinness World Records, it's the world's largest collection of haunted dolls and a major tourist attraction. So... Um, I like how there's like apparently competition for that of like <laughs> no. the most haunted dolls in one spot. Um, so there is so the company I was talking about is called Flashpack, and they're the tourist company that has uh 
going to this island as part of a package to go to Mexico during the Day of the Dead celebrations. So the travelers can be a part of the rituals to honor the dead. Um, I'm going to pretend that people are actually there for genuine cultural education and not just because they're shitty wealthy people um, appropriating <laughs> anything. Um, but so <clears throat> you can come to the Island of the Dolls. Part To be in this package, by the way, it's a nine-day package, $3,300 for the whole package. Oh, my. Um, so it's Wait, not, so how many days? It's a nine-day package where you do several different things across Mexico for the Day of the Dead celebrations. Got it. I mean, One I guess if that them. includes food, maybe it's worth it. I don't know that it includes sure. food, though. I don't know if it does. I'm going to have to find out. I appreciate that it's a little expensive, so, like, not everyone's just going to go do this, you know? Sure. Um, so Including us. <laughs> including us. If it was 20 bucks, it'd be like, we're going to Mexico. Um so in the 1950s is when the Island of the Dolls story begins. So uh, the dolls were collected by a former resident named Don Julian Santana Barrera. And uh, the story is kind of fishy, but the general consensus is he found a he saw a girl drowning in the water by his land and he tried to save her but couldn't get to her in time. Ugh. Um, so they don't. The story, the reason I say it's, like, kind of shady is that, like, they don't know if he saw her drowning, tried to save her, and then couldn't, or already found her dead, assumed she drowned, and then just had this overwhelming guilt that had he gotten there earlier or something like that. I see. So he, later on, after she had died, saw a doll in the water and assumed it was hers, so he grabbed it from the water and hung it up on a tree in honor of her. Goose can um, already. Already, yeah. I know. Already. So after he hangs up this doll on the tree, he begins to hear weird noises and whispers. He starts hearing screaming. He starts hearing crying. Um, he hears footsteps on the island, which keep in mind, like, this is a plot of land surrounded by water, and it's his property. So, like, nobody right. else should be on this land. Um, and so he's hearing the footsteps. Day, the day I hear crying in my house, that's like, I mean, it's usually me, but if it's not me, <laughs> then, like, I'm leaving forever. I'm sorry. I'll literally, you're going to show up in another box at my goddamn door and be like, this time, <laughs> this time it's permanent. I feel like, <laughs> hopefully I didn't bring anything with me. You won't even tell me you made it to LA. You'll just text me like, meet me at the Cheesecake Factory. <laughs> I already ordered you your cheesecake. <laughs> meet me at the factory. Um, <laughs> so, oh, and yeah. So they're miles from anyone. So he should not be able to hear anything. And he starts hearing screaming like directly on his property. Don Julian uh, later started having other paranormal experiences on the island. Um, he thought that the spirit of the girl probably couldn't move on or maybe even wouldn't move on. Like maybe just felt safe there and didn't want to move on. Um, <clears throat> and he would find more and more baby dolls drifting up to the island. Oh, God. Um he took it as a sign and began collecting the dolls as offerings to the little girl. But also, like, I would immediately be freaked out if I were surrounded by water and from all directions these random dolls were coming up on shore. Like, I would just be uncomfortable. Like, where the fuck did these dolls come from? Like, why are there so <laughs> yeah. many? Um, there are a lot of questions already uh, <laughs> that have not been answered. I like how you just thought, ah, offerings for the girl spirit. That <laughs> Ah, this makes sense. <laughs> I'd be like a doll warehouse clearly like caught on fire and these little <laughs> toy stories escaped. Like, um, okay. So he, yeah, he found more baby dolls. He started hanging them up everywhere as a way to either help the little girl move on or if she decided to stay on the land and she was maybe evil in some way, it was to keep her happy and appease her. Um, and so basically the, the rumor is that Don Julian was kind of losing it and believed that the dolls, this is one random rumor that I found on one source, by the way. So I don't know if this is a universal understanding, but Don Julian apparently is rumored to have started losing it and thought that the dolls were actually real children or the spirits of real children possessed these dolls that had oh, also no. died in the canal. Okay. To be fair, if we we're experiencing this and we heard crying at night like we would assume the exact same thing <laughs> i mean like, maybe doll factory but probably we would assume dead children so i don't know like maybe toy story gone wrong maybe <laughs> it's actually that there's just a slew of 
dead children's spirits in these toys, and now it's, it's no good. It's no good. So in 2001, Don Julian had a heart attack on the island, and he ended up dying, ironically, at the exact same spot where he found the girl. Oh, <gasps> okay. And after he died, the island became a major haunted tourist attraction, um, and locals claimed that the dolls come to life at night. So this literally is Toy Story <laughs> gone wrong. No, um, very, very wrong. Uh, locals say that uh, this is kind of precious, but also like maybe a little Stockholm syndrome and that like the locals say like, oh, it's not haunted. The the land is just charmed. It's like, okay. <laughs> okay. okay. We're really, we're really sugarcoating this one. Yeah. Um, Cause they say it's not haunted, but they all do say that the dolls will call you whisper you uh, whisper to you move on their own open their eyes laugh smile turn their heads and lure people onto the island presumably to kill them but the island's I, not haunted it's just charmed it's just charmed it's just magical a magical place <laughs> i just really hate <laughs> that i just started talking about hearing voices in my house and now you're talking about this this is not a good combo for me if those murmurs turn into like direct orders that's when you gotta go oh okay so it's become common practice at this point for visitors to actually bring their own offerings. Oftentimes they are their own dolls in exchange for either like blessings for the land or like protection on them as like, please don't follow me off of this land. Okay. <laughs> Stay here. Fair. I would literally, I'd be like, what was that girl's favorite 10 hundred 10, 10 or 10 to a hundred favorite candies. I'll bring literally all of them in a basket. <laughs> it's like Robert. You know, like trying yeah. to appease Robert the doll. <laughs> Literally. I mean, Robert the doll would fit very well here. He's probably the mayor of this Ooh. goddamn island. <laughs> so uh, so that's the only information I could find after looking through multiple sites. So the rest of this is just um, ghost adventures. Ooh, so okay. what makes this super fun is that Zach Bagans has a massive phobia of dolls and makes it very clear that he, like, does not want to do this episode. Then why does he have Peggy in his museum? I guess for that reason. I guess everyone's got a, an Achilles heel, and his is, his name is, his is named Peggy. So, um. <clears throat> so is mine, by the way. <laughs> so I'm just gonna, I literally just kind of wrote an account of the episode. Um, basically, the canals are a well-known according to this episode, to have very negative energy because on these waters was uh, the Mexican Revolution in 1911 and uh, bodies were apparently dumped here and skeletons were later pulled out like kind of by the by the bundle. There was just like lots of bodies in the water. Um, and Zach is going over by boat and he sees the theater company performing the La Llorona play. So that's where I got that information. So just to recap, in case you want to go listen to episode 92, where I covered La Llorona, it's about a woman who drowns her children and is trapped kind of between life and death. Um, so apparently on the island uh, where they perform the show, which is interesting because it's a separate island than the island of the dolls, um, but on that land where they perform La Llorona, one of the, they think the original little girl ghost actually wanders over there sometimes for the play. Oh, and well, that's fun. I mean, it's fun when I'm not there, for sure. It's fun to, like, think about from a very far distance, yes. It's it's fun to know that she's not near me because she's over there. <laughs> um, but so apparently uh, where they perform the show – the little girl will, will literally sometimes appear in the performance and Ugh. then they'll be like, why was there a little girl here? There is no little girl on the island. Um, <clears throat> so again, they think this could be the same little girl from the island of the dolls. Um, apparently Don Julian on his own, he was visited a lot by the girl um, and the dolls were just obviously there to keep the peace. Um, one of the boat rowers, or I, I don't know if he was, the guy who actually rode, uh, who, who rode Zach to the island, or maybe he was just passing by and saw that they were doing a segment, and he asked to be on camera, and he said that two weeks uh, previously to them, to when that recording was happening, apparently this boat rower, he was going through the canal and heard drumming, and it was getting closer and closer to a point where he felt like the drumming was coming from his boat, and he thought he was going to have a heart attack. 
Oh. Um, and he said that it became really violent, and then all of a sudden, he just went completely catatonic. He couldn't see or hear what people were saying. Um, he wouldn't respond to his family, and they he literally had to be exercised by a shaman. Oh, goodness. Um, and then apparently at after least, the- At least he got- at least he had to be on camera, though. Like, hey, can I, can I step in here for a moment? Honestly, if you, I feel like you deserve five minutes in the spotlight if you're going to be Absolutely. exercised. Uh, so apparently, after the ceremony, he said he could feel the shaman get scared, and he felt the energy leave his body and go into the shaman. So like the oh, shaman no. like became possessed on his behalf. Um, so that's pretty terrifying. So. Yeah. <laughs> Anyway, they think it's interesting that that happened while he was rowing through the canals, which is on the water that has all these bodies underneath it. Mm, no okay. um, So they don't know if the land is necessarily haunted, but the water surrounding all the islands is. Um, so they get to the island. Uh, it looks very, very disturbing. It looks exactly like what you're expecting an island of dolls to look like. Um <laughs> Zach does not want to get off the boat. Surprisingly, he does not look like he's acting this time around. He very much does not want to get off the boat. Um, and they meet up with Don's nephew, uh, Anastasio. And apparently he's the one that found Don's body in the water. Oh, shit. So apparently there's, I hadn't seen this anywhere. <coughs> Excuse me. I hadn't seen this anywhere, but in this episode alone, all of a sudden there's a talk, there's talks about like mermaids in the culture that apparently they believe, um, in, in mermaids. And so they think that, uh, apparently there was a big fish in the water when Don's <clears throat> nephew went to go grab his uncle out of the water. He saw this massive snake in the water and apparently that snake, um, or this, uh, not a snake, sorry, this big fish. Uh, was in the water next to the dead body. And apparently that big fish is not common in that area. And so they think that the fish is either a mermaid or some sort of underwater demon that Ooh. took his soul. Ooh, uh-oh. That's not um, Zach sees the shrine, the original shrine for the little girl. And he they also point out to Zach the original doll that Don found in the water that he thought was the little girls who died. Um and basically, Zach is very terrified. I recommend this episode if you're interested in watching that. Um, I am. <laughs> I am. <laughs> uh, this is a quote when they were pointing out some of the dolls near, like, the original shrine. Uh, Don's nephew says, they move in a particular way, not like they move just one arm or their eye. It's the whole body. Oh. So the dolls literally just, la, 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 like, come to life. <laughs> Oh, God. Um, okay. <laughs> one apparently makes crying sounds as if the doll has batteries, but it's not a battery-powered doll. Ugh. No, 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 no. Uh, so they leave the island for more research, and Zach uh, basically says, okay, this is my favorite part of the whole fucking episode, so like, just get ready, Christine. Tell me. So, <laughs> okay. <laughs> what? <laughs> so they leave the island for more research, and Zach... Tells the the rest of his crew, like, okay, well, we have, um, we're bringing a guest with us to to the island tonight. And he has this old fucking suitcase, right? He's like, the guest is in the suitcase. And so he warns the crew, not just the, not just his crew, but like the camera crew. He's like, nobody except me is going to touch this suitcase tonight. And nobody's going to look, speak to, or touch our guest. And he opens up the suitcase, and it's Harold the doll. No. The Harold. <sighs> I remember watching the episode at 3 in the morning, and I was like, I am lucid dreaming. Like, if I'm having, like, some sort of, like, Marvel Cinematic Universe, like, a, a crossing of worlds here. Right, because, um, like, he doesn't have Harold, right? He has Peggy. No, he has, he has Peggy. And then Peggy. I assume at some point, I don't know if he has yet, but I expect him to own Annabelle. Because Annabelle's in the Warren Museum, right. and since the Warrens are dead, I kind of just expect that he's going to buy the whole fucking museum. Um, I wonder how we got Harold. Apparently, I don't, I don't know, but the owner was on site, and so the owner oh. like just warned them. Um, the owner was like, "I'm not letting you take him without my my chaperoning." Right. 
So, right. by the way, if you have not, if you're listening backwards through our podcast and you haven't gotten to Harold the Bell yet, probably one of my favorite episodes we've ever done. That was the that creepiest was thing. One. And so it was episode 86, by the way. Also, to remind everyone of the update we got after that episode was Harold <gasps> the Doll right. literally fucking reached out to us. Like his owner tweeted us and said that yes. he listened to the episode and said that we did a good job with it, which is terrifying. They're just terrifying, exactly. So, so we have a link to Harold, and now ZB has a link to Harold. So we have we're one degree away, basically. Like, wait a minute, like six degrees of Kevin Bacon. Like we're one degree away from Harold the Doll. Actually, zero because he's spoken. We're to us. zero. We're one away from ZB, though. I see what you're saying. Yes, I agree. I and it's I don't like it. Um, <laughs> as we slowly adjust to a new normal, we still need to be smart about how we do business. And luckily, Stamps.com is there to make things easier for all of us. Thousands of small business owners have discovered the benefits of Stamps.com in recent months, including us, except we found it way more than a recent months ago because it's been a <laughs> lifesaver for like probably years. Stamps.com brings all the mailing and shipping services you need right to your computer in the comfort of your home or office. And whether you're a small business like us and sending invoices or an online seller shop, uh, shipping out products, or you're just working from home and need to mail stuff, Stamps.com can handle it all with ease. You simply just use your computer to print official U.S. postage 24-7 um, to any letter, any package, any class of mail, anywhere you want to send it. And once your mail is ready, you leave it with your mail carrier or you schedule a pickup or drop in a mailbox. I mean, it's just super simple. It's very easy. Uh, and like we said, with stamps.com, you get great discounts. So you get five cents off every stamp, uh, up to 62% off USPS and U UPS shipping rates. Um, I remember the day I discovered I could use stamps.com for personal use also in addition to business use. And I like have not gone to a post office ever since. So I can highly recommend it no matter what you're mailing. Um, <laughs> and right now, by the way, our listeners get a special offer that includes a four week trial plus free postage and a digital scale without any long term commitment. Just go to stamps.com and click on the microphone at the top of the homepage and type in drink. Drink. That's stamps.com. Enter drink. drink. Native deodorant, I will just tell you right now, it doesn't just block odor better, it's made better. So you could be like proud to use it. I know I am. Um, it has coconut oil, shea butter, uh, tapioca starch. It's also vegan, so it's never tested on animals, which, as you know, is pretty important to me. Um, but it works and it doesn't need aluminum to like plug up your sweat glands. Um, it actually works without some dangerous ingredients, some potentially dangerous ingredients. Um, and like I said, switching to an aluminum free deodorant does not mean you have to sacrifice on odor protection. Just ask me in my armpits. I mean, we really have spent the last three years talking about how like weirdly sweaty we are, whether or not anxiety is involved just as a general baseline as yes. a human. And, mm -hmm. uh, for some reason, all of a sudden now we are not at all sweaty and the reason is native and our favorite part, which we talk about every single time is the many scents that there are. There's. <sighs> So Over good. 10 cents, including rotating seasonal ones. Um, my favorite is still coconut lavender. Mm -hmm. I know mm -hmm. yours is the cucumber mint, I think. It's so, yes, that's that's my favorite personally. But um, I haven't tried citrus and herbal yet, which like that sounds like maybe a new lemony scent that I need to try. <laughs> so I'll let you know how Native, that goes. Native, if you come up with a lemon scent, you're in trouble. <laughs> you're you're going to be sold Goodbye. out immediately. <laughs> Uh, Native is risk free to try, and every product comes with free shipping with the uh, within the U.S. Plus, there are a uh, plus free thirty day returns and exchanges. So uh, there are you could also see why many people love Native and check out over fourteen thousand five star reviews of theirs. I mean, we're not the only people raving about this. It's amazing. It's really such it's a amazing. wonderful product, and you can like pick a d certain scent for your purse, pick a certain scent for your car. I know I do. Um, put one in each bathroom. It's I just love Native so much. So do what we did. Make the switch to Native today by going to nativedo.com slash drink or use, or use promo code drink at checkout and get 20% off your first order. That's nativedo.com slash drink or use promo code drink at checkout for 20% off your first order. Another little recap real quick on Harold the Doll. So it's he laughs, sings, moves on his own. Um, one time a priest told the family to burn it. Um, and it wouldn't burn. It wouldn't catch on fire. Um, it's just a fucking terrifying doll. It's really one of my favorite episodes we've ever covered. A lot of people did not like it because it was so scary. You're welcome. Doing my job. We got people, I mean, legitimately saying like I got uh, into a fender bender or I had a migraine mm -hmm. for the first time in 20 years. And we were like, we really should have put out a waiver or something because we got a lot of emails after that one. Well, I think because PTD, I think, came after Harold. And so I That's wasn't right. taking any risks with that one. I was like, okay, the last time a That's lot of people right. said they like 
One was like, oh yeah, I was listening to the episode and then my dad got like a heart attack, like something really That's, traumatic. I remember that one. We were like, what do we do? <laughs> I was like, okay, well, so then I, I talked about PTD and I gave a content warning and I was like, I will never say that doll's full name. Um, <laughs> anyway, so another thing about Harold, one of the things that freaked me out was apparently if you look into the doll's eyes, or at least with one of the family, uh, one of the owners who it got passed down to at one point, looked Harold in the eyes and then said that she had a massive migraine and went to the hospital later and found out she had a brain tumor. Um, oh, my God. I mean, this which, is— Which, like, by the way, if you have a migraine right now and you're listening to our podcast, you do not have a brain tumor. I'm not, like, fucking no, telling no, you— No, 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 no. I promise. Do not sue us. Don't listen to M and don't listen to WebMD. Both not Actually, medical professionals. Just turn off the podcast. Um, <laughs> so, anyway, so— Harold the doll will be their uh, escort through the island of dolls. This is insanity. Um, and so Don's nephew uh, definitely feels a lot of energy on the island when he's there. Um, and apparently when people come with bad energy, that's when the negative vibes happen. So I think that's where that kind of ties into their belief that the island is charmed, not haunted. Because see. if you come with a good outlook and good intentions, then it's the nothing scary will happen. But if you bring scary intentions with you, then it's, Got it. Not a good, not a good look. Um, so Zach takes Harold to a psychic on the island who says that Harold has five spirits inside of him. Uh, and it says that he likes to make people sick. (laughs) How fun. (laughs) It's his favorite playtime activity. (laughs) You know, the swings, giving people tumors. So, (laughs) so Don, uh, makes contact uh, so like Don Julian, who died, makes contact with the medium while they're having this uh, conversation and says that his favorite doll is named uh, Augustinita, who I, I guess has her own shrine on the island. And when <laughs> this is a very Christine thing from Beyond the Grave, says, <laughs> when you go on the island tonight, I want you guys to cheers for me with my favorite drink. Oh, that's fun. That's another playtime. So. That's Christine's favorite playtime activity, pressuring people to you drink know, with me. Christine... No, no. Christine's favorite acti- activity is doing the drinking. Okay, fine. My favorite activity is waiting for somebody to ask me to drink on their behalf. <laughs> How's that? <laughs> yes. It, you wish someone in, in your Gemini spirit, you wish someone would hand you a drink and then say, this is for you because you're amazing. And then you, Thank like, you. face it. Uh-huh. And always the times when I say, I'm not going to drink tonight, I don't think. And then I'm like, hello, where's my spirit guide that just kind of says, like, come on. <laughs> You're okay. <laughs> You're going to be fine. So uh, a medium, the medium says that the big fish in the water is a massive snake said to be uh, a spirit living with the dead, sometimes takes the form of a mermaid, which kind of matches with the cultural belief, I think, at the time. Right. Um, the little girl is said uh, to also be taken by the snake. So in that case, Don and the little girl were both killed by the same thing in the same spot. Oh. Um, and... The medium says to look out for their hands and arms because that's where the ghosts on the island like to attack first. Um, oh, to, to watch out for their own arms. Watch out for oh. your hands and arms. And apparently... Oh, no, 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 no. I think she meant that specifically for Harold, too, where she was like, look out for your hands and arms because Harold's going to try to hurt you there first. Um, oh, if my you piss God. Him off. Okay. So, interestingly enough, Zach, because he's the only one that's touching the doll, they have it on camera that when he pulled... Harold the doll out of the suitcase. He grabbed him by, uh, he kind of grabbed uh, just his full body, the full body of the doll, but he had been told earlier to be careful with Harold's left arm because it was slowly starting to kind of tear off. Okay. Excuse me. And oh, weird. interestingly, Zach's left arm starts to feel a lot of pain and you see these bruises. Literally, I mean, I don't think this was makeup or anything. It You could see real bruises forming on Zach's arm that looked like a little baby hand. Ew. <laughs> Ew! It was the horrifying. creepiest. It like a little like little doll hands that like I'm oh, sure no, if you no, put no, no. Harold's arm up next to it, it would have matched his fingers. Uh uh-uh. uh Um. <clears throat> so, uh, this is I I can't obviously tell a Ghost Adventures episode without giving you like a Zach ism of the episode. Thank you. Thank you. So here is what I found to be the most. Uh, emo dramatic sentence to come out of him. Yes. They were rowing towards the island for their nighttime investigation and he says, which I don't even think by the way is a full sentence. Um, 
This ancient canal system is like a network of veins pumping this cursed water mixed with the blood and souls of all the bodies dumped here, polluting the bottom with bones. <laughs> it just sounds like he's trying a little too hard. It sounds like I would have written that. That's like the title to my Zanga article. Yeah, uh, <laughs> your Zanga article. Yeah, that's like the title of like one of my uh, journal entries from 10th grade. Just like just like a quick poem I wrote. It's like it's a post. It's a MySpace survey post. And like then you click it and it's not as dark as you thought. Cause it's like, have you been kissed before? Um, <laughs> it's like when they fill you, they make you fill those things out, hoping like that your crush or whoever reads it where it's like, when was the last time you cried? What was your what's your favorite color? And then it's like, what's your favorite line of poetry? The bottom is cursed with bones. That's like, probably this why. Is the- this is the only poetry you need. It's by Zach Dagobites. <laughs> so oh, no. um, immediately they start hearing uh, knocks uh, on the building and they hear someone throwing cans around on the island. And for no reason at all, I got to say, like, if this is real, it's real fucking freaky. Um, for no reason at all, all of a sudden, right where they had been standing when they got off of the boat and no one has gotten off of the or has gotten on or off the island since. Right where they originally stood, they turn around and all of a sudden a fire has started itself. No. What? Literally, and it's getting bigger. Like they're filming it being like, how the fuck did this happen? And it's like slowly growing into like a kind of big campfire. I mean, size that had thing. to be like a PA or something, right? Like they're I, really. I like to think right? it's someone like smoking a cigarette and they just kind of toss it or something. Right. But and then they're like, it wasn't me. I don't know who did it. It's a ghost. <laughs> if that were real, I hate it. Um. And so Zach goes into the shrine of the dolls, um, is about to take out Harold the doll, and one of the dolls on the wall starts cackling by itself when it doesn't have batteries. Nope, 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 nope. nope. Full-blown, like, the creepiest little girl, like, tickle me Elmo laugh. And you can hear Um, it? You can hear it for sure. Oh, God, Um, okay. And it's, I, again... I like to try to keep an open mind on this, but again, I it didn't look like he was acting. He was definitely more freaked out than in most episodes because he was literally on an island full of the thing he hates the most. His worst And, fear. like, it started laughing, and he bolts it. Like, he's like, fuck this. Oh, um, no. <laughs> and so apparently you can also see a shadow man walking on the island. They heard people singing. They heard a girl screaming and crying. Um, they also go to the hut where Dawn actually lived on the island, and uh, they have his friend come with them on the island to like talk to Don for them. And uh, basically they say, if you're not comfortable with the people here, let us know. And then a black orb shoots out from the hut, um, which you can see on camera. They all take a shot together as per per his request. That's fun. Um, and then they bring out the spirit box and the spirit box seems to react whenever his friend is talking to him, whenever Don's friend is reaching out. Um, and then they hear footsteps and a shadow appears on the camera. And Zach basically says, are you trapped inside of these dolls? And an EVP said, or I think he's holding Harold as he says that. Are you trapped in these dolls? And he gets an EVP of a man very clearly saying, I don't like her, stupid. And he's like pointing what? at a bunch of like feminine-esque looking dolls. Um, oh, God. And he says, I don't like her, stupid. Uh, okay. Zach then says that he feels a hand run down his back and he feels ice cold. And infrared does show there are extreme temperature changes uh, near Harold the doll. So he goes from extreme cold to extreme uh, extreme heat um, on its own without being touched, like the doll itself mm. does. So that is the story of the island of the dolls, mainly through the eyes of Zach Bagelbites. Oh, my goodness. I just love that they took a shot in the middle of the, all of that. <laughs> I do too. Also, like you know, if you go before me, Christine, I'm gonna have to learn how to drink in honor of you. I'm be like, Eva, you gotta help me out. (laughs) What did they take a shot of? Do we know? We do, but I didn't write it down. But it was apparently Don's favorite drink, and I hadn't heard of it before. Okay, damn, I'm curious. Um, Okay, well, that was terrifying. Thank you so much for bringing dolls back into our subconscious. You are welcome. All right, um, I am very excited for my story today. Uh, and I hope you are too. I am very excited to hear about it. Uh, I heard the excitement in your voice, which spiritually uh, boosts my levels as well. Oh, good. Okay. 
Well, I think other people are going to be excited about it, too, because this is an episode um, of Unsolved Mysteries, which recently um, just came back on Netflix. And Mm. we've gotten a lot of uh, requests to watch it and questions about whether we're watching it. And I so I binged the whole thing in about one evening and um, everyone was I noticed everyone was asking me to cover the disappear or the murder of Ray Rivera. And I was like, I don't remember that at all. Then I went to Netflix and somehow I skipped that episode only. Like, I don't know how it. Oh, well, actually, I think what happened was I watched the UFO episode first. And so then I somehow accidentally skipped Ray Rivera. But I felt like it was a sign. So I started watching it and I took some notes and then I got like way in deep uh, in a few rabbit holes about it. So this is the mysterious murder. There's so many of them and we always fall into them. This is the mysterious murder of Ray Rivera. And um, I'm just going to I'm also like on an unsolved kick. So like the next couple stories that I'm covering are uh, unsolved cases. So just Perfect. knuckle and buckle, baby. This is going to be fun. <laughs> knuckle and buck. Knuck and buck. That's what I always knuck say. We try it. We keep trying to make it a thing. It's not working. When um, I say that's what I always say, I mean, that's only me. That's all that I say. That's what, right, that's what no I one say. Else will. No one else enjoys it or wants to say it themselves. Um, right. So I guess I'll say let's crack into it. Okay, so this is the story of Ray Rivera. So Ray Rivera was a 32-year-old screenwriter and aspiring filmmaker. He and his wife, Allison, lived in California, but in 2006, they decided to move to Baltimore, where Ray could work with his lifelong friend, Porter Stansberry. Uh, Porter, his friend Porter, uh, had an investment company called Stansberry and Associates, and he had always wanted Ray to come work with him. And he, Ray initially, like, decline this offer and then after a while he realized he wasn't really making much headway in the film industry so he and Allison compromised and said okay why don't we move to Baltimore for two years 24 months and like he'll work and make some money and then he can try his hand at screenwriting again to like try and get back Mm. into the industry Got it. so Porter and Ray had been friends since high school they had played water polo together like had gone to proms together like they were just really they went way back Um, And so when uh, Allison and Ray moved to Baltimore, they were a little anxious about like moving all the way across the country, but they pretty quickly found a beautiful home. They like made a really happy life there. And like within, I think like a month, they were like set and they were like, we were so happy we moved. Um, They had only been married for six months at this point. And by all accounts that I've heard, they were very much in love, very happy, like hadn't, you know, super early into their marriage. So probably still like honeymoon phase. Um, and from what I've heard from the fam, both families, like they were just, you know, living their lives and happy as clams. Um, so it, on May to th- okay, May 16th, 2006, Allison, uh, left for a business trip early in the morning and Ray woke up with her. He made her breakfast. He carried her suitcase to the car. Um, they kissed each other goodbye. And she said, I love you so much. And he said, thank you for loving me so much, which I just thought was the sweetest little exchange. That is um, it is really sweet. They, they were apparently lovebirds. Um, Allison heads out on her trip and throughout the day gives Ray a call. But for whatever reason, he's not picking up. And that's pretty unusual because they talk multiple times a day. Um, so she just thinks it's strange that he wouldn't be answering. I feel like the last like I guess maybe not consistently, but in the last several recordings, I feel like your stories have all been like, oh, and the husband didn't answer the first time in 18 years. (laughs) Like, didn't answer the phone. (laughs) I feel like you had that in the last one, too, where, like, all of a sudden, like, he ended up probably killing his wife or something like that. And But Jeffrey Dahmer? No, it was one that you just, you must have just covered only within the last couple weeks. But it was uh, the... Like the, they always had like a scheduled like standing call at eight thirty in the morning oh. with each other, and uh, I already forget what that was. <laughs> oh well, I remember you just like told that story, and so that immediately came back. Where I was like, "This that is must interesting. have been like a month ago or a while ago, though, because before Jeffrey Dahmer, I did the two cases, the two um, right, uh, Dominique Fells. Uh, so I don't mm. know. I mean. I'll I'll go back and peruse. My brain doesn't Maybe hold that I just much made the information. Whole thing up. <laughs> no, I do remember that. I just am embarrassed because I should remember the story. But 
I don't I, remember what I covered last week. It's fine. Don't worry about it. It's okay. I okay, shouldn't have. Like, I, will, I don't know why I did that thing where I like challenged you on something you probably had no. No, we need always to know. do that to each other, and I should remember <laughs> it. I do. I do vaguely remember that story. Oh yeah, and like, oh god, I forget. Yeah, I do remember telling it's, that story though. Um, okay, so, right, he doesn't pick up the phone, um, and they had a house guest named Claudia staying with them, who was one of Allison's colleagues, and Allison calls Claudia and is like, so Ray isn't answering my calls, do you know where he is? And Claudia says, okay, so Ray received a phone call around 5.30 or 6.30 this evening, during which he said, oh shit, and rushed out of the house. And uh, Allison's like, has he come back? And she says, oh, he came back inside shortly after as if he had forgotten something, then ran back out, jumped in Allison's SUV and drove off. Okay. So Allison's like alarmed by this because she knows he's working on this huge project for Stansberry and Associates where he works. Um, But at this point, he's been working from home for a really long time. So there's like no reason he should be um, going into the office, um, especially so like frantically. Mm -hmm. So... She's a little weirded out, especially because he's not answering her phone calls. And then the next morning, Claudia calls Allison again and says, OK, I have some bad news. Ray didn't come home at all last night after rushing off in the SUV. Ooh. So Allison's like, something is definitely wrong. Um, she calls Ray's mom, who lives in Puerto Rico, and his brother Angel. And they both fly in like immediately because they immediately know something is not right. Um, and they know Ray is not one to just vanish and not tell anyone where he's going. So when Allison returns from uh, from her trip, her house is almost like it was described like a time capsule almost or like it was like stopped in time. Um, so her black SUV is gone. But in the kitchen, there's an open can of soda, a half eaten bag of chips. His Invisaligns are sitting on the counter. Um, all the lights are on in the house, like his office and bedroom lights are on. So it just almost looks like as if somebody just like plucked him out of the scene. Basically, It's so wild. It's. I know I've mentioned this before and this has nothing to do with the story, but I'm a Gemini and I'm going to make it about me. Um, <laughs> but the slaughter, the slaughter pen that I used to always go to and Oh school, God. Yeah. It was so weird when you would look into the windows and like, I don't, you would think they would have an explanation publicly stated about what happened there, but like you can look in the windows and literally it looks like someone was just plucked out. Like you can see like, cat food sitting in a bowl like Ugh. just wa- like waiting to like be given to a cat um or like you can see like a cabinet is open and like you can see like dishes and cups in there and like Ugh. it just looks like a scene where the like the 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 legend in Fredericksburg is like the a family just straight up just abandoned like just walked out one day and just never came back and it looks like in a in a frenzy it's very oh. creepy. So it's and just weird left to, everything. That's the creepiest part yeah. is like, it's just untouched. Something just about that. Like they makes just like, it, like something scared them. And they just ran off and never came back. Right. Like it was that, that alarming or that scary that it wasn't worth like even putting your Invisaligns away or whatever it may be. Right. 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 right or right. grabbing your soda. Right. So it, it's just like extra spooky. So she's definitely on edge at this point. All the lights are on too. And they had been overnight. So something's really weird. Um, Allison's and Ray's families both arrive. They uh, stay at Allison's place and they the dining room becomes like their kind of home base um, for their search. They didn't call police right away. They were like, OK, maybe this is just a misunderstanding. And he went somewhere and forgot to tell us. So they start searching hospitals, looking for a John Doe. They're canvassing the streets, um, hoping they can figure out what's going on without calling the police. And Porter, who the guy, the friend who had convinced him to move to Baltimore, um, put up a reward of $1,000 and got the media involved in an attempt to find Ray. Um, and at this point, there had been no transactions whatsoever made on Ray's credit cards. Um, there, his cell phone was dead when they called it. Uh, Allison's and Ray's bank account, like no money had been taken out. So this is all a bad sign because <laughs> the phone's mm. dead. The credit cards are silent. Right. Something's not right. Um, like I said, the car was also missing. So every so often, um, so ever so often, a few of them would go searching the streets, like looking for the SUV, because at least then they'd have kind of a clue. Um, like where they went, maybe, or like a lo- another step to like, yeah, where they like dropped the, fir- the car. or Exactly. Because it was at this point, it's just like, he's been like plucked out of his house and they have zero idea, like no clue where the hell he could possibly just be. Just vanished. So, just vanished. So they want like one thing to go off of. And fortunately... Um, Six days after his disappearance, Allison's parents are out searching for the car when her mom spots it in a parking lot downtown. 
So oh, they find okay. the car. Yeah. And this is like a huge deal. Like the first quote unquote break in the case, if you will. Um, so the car had a ticket on it that was dated the day after Ray disappeared, uh, leading them to believe it had been parked there pretty much since the night he vanished. <clears throat> and oh boy. The par- yeah. So the parking attendant said the car was not there the night Ray disappeared uh, when he got off of work. But when he arrived for work the next morning, it was there. So essentially, it had been parked there that night and had been there for six straight days. Uh, so okay. not good. And this part, this was in the Unsolved episode. And I don't know why, but this kind of broke my heart. Um, it was Allison kind of, she said, I was standing here when we found the car looking around in this random parking lot. And she's like looking up at the sky and at the buildings. And she just keeps saying, why are you here? Why would you be here? What were you looking for? Or what? who were you meeting? Like she's like saying she was trying to wow. get into his head and trying to understand. Because um, she's like, we were so close. Like I just wanted to understand what the hell he was doing here. Like if there's any right. way I could figure out what purpose this parking lot holds it's a it's a uh, it's like the sad version of in the office when like holly like is able to trace michael's every step it's like oh well he clearly wants to know like is that the biggest egg roll like i i gotta go over there and go to that chinese restaurant and they find his photo on the wall (laughs) (laughs) uh but yeah i imagine it's a very sad version of that like trying to figure out what direction he would have even walked Like, right, exactly. Like, get into his head and be like, what were you thinking? Um, And that's actually really creepy that you brought that up because the next thing they do is a couple of his coworkers go up to a rooftop um, (gasps) to see if, like, I'm not even making this up, to see, like, if they can figure out uh, anything from up high or, like, look around and see if they can spot anything. Um, and so they they climbed on top of this uh, parking garage roof to look around. And while up there... They spotted something odd down below on one of the roofs attached to a building called the Belvedere Hotel. So the Belvedere Hotel used to be a historic hotel. Um, It had since been turned into condominiums, but it has that very classic, like, creepy old school hotel vibe where they're, like, leaning into the traditional decor and everything, and it looks haunted and spooky. Um, So that's kind of the the vibe that this hotel has. Sure. Um, Kind of like the Fister or wherever we stayed. Uh, yeah, in I like remember Milwaukee. <laughs> yeah, like yes, kind of Fister. Creepy. Yeah, <laughs> damn, that was a creepy fucking hotel. That was a freaky hotel. I mean, that's so. I think the most freaky was that one in uh, New Orleans, but where we met Michael. Uh, but hands uh, down, New Orleans. <laughs> where- but I mean, we literally we were not even. We were boarding our, or uh, we were buying our plane tickets to New Orleans, and we were like, "Well, obviously, this is going to be the creepiest fucking experience we've ever had." That's true. We knew that going into it. You're right, <laughs> and I booked yeah. us like the most haunted hotel I could find. So that was and my bad. I came into New Orleans a, a night before you guys, and I wanted to stay at the the Delphine or the oh yeah some the Dauphine Hotel. I think yes, yes. it's all it's supposed to be like the one of the most haunted hotels outside the one you went to. And yeah. the second I got in there, I was like unpacking my bag and the TV wouldn't stop turning on and off by itself. And I was like, okay, well, great. And like Christine good isn't time. even here for me to run to. <laughs> yeah, that was the only good thing is that we could go to each other's rooms in that one hotel every time the ghost child showed up. Yeah. Um, yeah. So this is a creepy ass hotel. Let's just put it that way. Um, so they look down and they see uh, this rooftop and they see something odd on top of the roof. And it's uh, a small hole. So they spot this small hole um, and it's like this flat white roof and then a smashed hole kind of into the otherwise smooth surface. So they see this hole and they call 911 immediately to be like, hey, we're looking for our friend who disappeared and we found this weird hole. Can somebody come check it out? So the police arrive to check out the Belvedere Hotel. They ask the property manager to uh, open the door and apparently where this roof was um the room was the old racket club uh or it was also called the old church space so already sounds haunted as hell to me i yeah Um, i would not go there and like creepily enough on top of the next to the hole upstairs they took a closer look and they found a pair of flip-flops and a cell phone so that's what's on top of the roof now they go inside the space um and the property manager opens the door and immediately immediately they are hit with a foul stench and it is the stench of a dead body. Yeah. 
So they see blood coming down the wall. Um, it, it is Ray. His legs are positioned toward the door, and you can look up through the hole and see the sky through it. So the ceiling is this like metal roof, and the hole had just been busted right through it. Um, they actually yeah. interviewed it's like the former. I was, I was going to say. So did he? F- like it's like he just fell through the roof and then just lied there, looking out the at the sky, hoping someone finds him. Well, he wasn't looking out the sky. I, I'm just saying, like, if you looked in and looked up, you could see through the hole. Like, it was big enough oh. where you could look out. But, I mean, yes. So, the idea is that he fell through the hole and obviously died at that point. Um, I see. On okay. impact, presumably. Um, but so, basically, I just said that so that you can understand how big, like, the hole's big enough to look out of um, where you can gotcha. see. Okay. And it's not very big. Like, you could kind of, you'd kind of have to, like, squeeze your way into it. Um, but it is big enough. Uh, for somebody to fit through it. Gotcha. Um, So they interviewed the former manager, Gary, and he's the one who had found the body. Um, He mentioned in this unsolved episode that to this day, when sometimes when he opens a door, he'll have a flashback of the body. And he says it like haunts him. So, I mean, this was like extremely traumatic for him. I just thought that was really sad and scary um, that he still has like flashbacks to this day when he's just minding his own business and opens a door and finds a body. Um, yeah. Ray's body was examined. Uh, it was a wreck. He had broken ribs, punctured lungs, multiple lacerations, um, that were seven to nine inches long. He had damage to his skull, two breaks in his right leg to where the bone was protruding through the leg. Um, and just more, even more injuries than that. Um, oh pretty God. immediately. Yeah. It was very, uh, gruesome, just very, yeah. his body was destroyed basically. Yeah. So at this point, they pretty immediately consider uh, Ray's death a suicide. And uh, and by that, by they, they, I mean the Baltimore police. Um, they believe he had jumped from a, the top of a nearby building onto this roof and had busted through and died on impact. So they're looking at this okay. as a fall, kind of going through like a projectile sort of um, and, and hitting the floor of this like abandoned room pretty much. And so and I, is, is the... Uh, the general unsolved mystery. Why was he jumping from roof to roof, like parkour or something? Or <laughs> going back to the office. Um, I mean, I can't think of another reason why you're, unless you're Spider Man or some shit like that. Well, so they believe it's suicide at this point. Oh fuck! Wow, I'm an asshole. Okay, I thought we were just jumping from building to building for like recreation. Okay. No, no, no. Sorry. So the Baltimore police assume right away that this is a suicide and that he jumped from a high roof onto this surface and was killed on impact. Um, and I'm so sure that's you literally of- said that and it just uh, clearly <laughs> didn't. It just, my, my brain was clearly trying to think about parkour as you're giving me the answer and I'm not <laughs> listening to you. I'm so That's sorry. okay. I should have said it more assertively. I don't know. You literally said, probably said the word suicide and I was thinking about parkour. So I was not paying attention. My bad. <laughs> okay. Well, there, there it is. There's the update. Um, so I okay. guess now we're hopefully all on the same page. Um, yes. Yeah, so they believe, I was the they last one to get suicide. <laughs> it's okay. We'll wait for you. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> so like I said, they're looking at this as if he had gone through the roof, like a projectile sort of. But this is where things start to get weird. Okay. So remember how I said his phone was found near the hole? Yes. With flip flops. With the flip flops. So they take his phone and they find it completely undamaged, not a scratch. It literally works. Like they charge it up and it works like a normal phone. Uh, and I mean, this is before iPhones. So it's like it, it, it wasn't like a glass, you know, fragile object well, if what but. you're telling me is it was a nokia then of course it survived <laughs> <laughs> right okay fair point if it was like a blackberry or something yeah those are pretty <laughs> tough um but it didn't even get a scratch like it was perfectly preserved um his flip-flops were fine and then the other weird thing is they found his glasses nearby and they also mm. were completely uh preserved no scratch nothing on his glasses weird okay and it's just weird because the state of his body was so damaged that, like, right. not even a scratch on the glasses is just a strange uh, inconsistency, I guess. Um, so along with that, the medical examiner also ruled Ray's death inconclusive, saying the injuries were inconsistent with a fall. And this is kind of like one of those con- uh, 
contentious points because a lot of times a medical examiner will not make a statement either way because there's not enough evidence. So it's not necessarily like damning if a medical examiner says like, oh, I don't know that this was a fall. Like it could just be they weren't 100% positive. But that right. being said, Allison said she met with the medical examiner, quote, and I closed the door and she said, I know what they're trying to do and we are not closing this case. And that is a weird mystery wow. that even Allison says that uh, they said that what wasn't consistent with the fall was the way that his shins were broken. And that's all that she would say. So basically, mm. Allison talked to the Emmy who was like, I, who said, I know what they're trying to do. And Allison was like, I don't know what she meant by that, but it sounds really ominous. Um, and also said that the shins, the way they were broken, didn't look like a fall. So a little bit fishy already. So could this then be just like a, like he owed money to a loan shark who like did the classic, like breaking your kneecaps thing? Yeah. So that there's definitely theories as to like whether this was a murder, a suicide, whatever. Um, but I'll tell you those theories, but I don't know if loan shark is one of them because they didn't have any money problems. Um, okay. And they, he was actually making pretty good money. Um, but there are a couple mm -hmm. theories that we'll get into that concern f foul play. So okay. we shall see. Um, so they, okay. Blah, blah, blah. So it would have been, a, this is another weird point is that it would have been a 45 foot jump from the roof of the Belvedere to the hole that he went through. Um, and we'll put a picture in the YouTube video. Basically that jump was described by one investigator as virtually impossible. Um, so this jump would have been 45 feet. Um, and the jump was described by one investigator as virtually impossible. Um, okay. of course, like Reddit sleuths are all over this trying to like figure out the formula of a jump and how fast you'd have to be running to make this sure. jump happen. Um, there's one user named Peanut Baron who posted an engineering study obtained by the examiner concluded that based on the distance that R Rivera's body landed from the wall, estimated uh, to be roughly 43 feet, he would have been running roughly 11 miles per hour. And according to the Telegraph, the average man jogs at a speed of 8.3 miles per hour in 27 seconds. And he didn't have that much space to run on if he were on a rooftop. So essentially, right. he would have been having to like run really fast to to be able to like get sprinting that sprinting um, with all his might. Yes. And the other weird thing is he was really in shape, but he was also wearing flip flops. So like, right. Okay. It's kind of weird. He would have had to be like sprinting really quickly in order to make it that far of a jump, which is just mm -hmm. a strange, you know, I guess you don't necessarily always see that if someone is jumping off a building, uh, like such an extreme running start. I don't know. I mean, maybe, but. Right. Especially with such just, a short distance, you said, like he didn't have yeah. a lot of time to gain momentum or anything. Exactly. That was the other weird thing. And since his flip flops presumably came with him to the bottom and weren't even like, right. you know, messed up, then that's another just strange fact. So um, let's see. The other weird thing is that Ray's, so Ray had this money clip that Allison had given him. It was an heirloom of her family and it was never found. And it's weird because he was always known to carry it with him. Um, like always. His wife actually mm. saw it that morning when she left for her business trip. He had it on him that day. So it it's just strange. Like it could have fallen somewhere else. But since all his other belongings were right there, it just seemed weird that it was missing. It wasn't on his body. Um, so that's just another strange thing. And since then, it's never been found. Right. Um, and now this is like another thing that these are all very circumstantial. So I'll just put that out there. But they are, you know, a little they put they put a little doubt, at least in my mind. Um, and another weird thing is that he had this extreme fear of heights and it was like debilitating to the point that Allison was like, he would never, she was like, even if he was taking his own life, like this is not the way he would do it. Like right. he would never have been on this rooftop under any circumstances. Um, and so this is just another weird inconsistency where she's already at this point being like this, something's wrong. This is not what right. you're saying it is. Not doesn't check. Doesn't check. Doesn't track. Right. Um, so on top of that, again, I know very clearly that this does not count as solid proof or evidence. Um, but from, by all accounts, Ray was in an extremely happy place in his life and in his marriage. Um, at least according to family and friends, they couldn't find one person to say he was like depressed or, um, considering taking his own life, which again, that doesn't prove anything. People have thoughts that other people don't know about. 
Um, people don't always share their fears and anxieties and depressions with other people. So I, f- I am fully aware of that. It just sowed a seed of doubt in his family and friends who were like, we talked to him every day. Like he was so fine and happy. And um, he right. was already, they were already planning their move back to California. Um, he and Allison had been married six months. So they were like in blissful marriage heaven. Um, right. There was just, they had good money. Like they didn't have any money problems, which is often, uh, you know, a stressor in these kind of scenarios. <laughs> and right. uh, he was also really, really looking forward to having a baby. And so that was like their next step was moving back to California and he wanted to have a kid. And so it just was a little bit strange that all of a sudden he would do this so dramatically um, and there would be no inkling in anyone's mind. Again, this is just like other people's opinions. And I know in a lot of times in a suicide case, family and friends don't want to believe that that's what it was because there's like an element of guilt. Like, why didn't I see it or say something? Um, right. So I do fully understand that that could, you know, just be what it was, but it is something else to take into account, in my opinion. Right. So this is where things start to get really weird, um, like, <laughs> like really creepy and strange. Okay. So when searching through their home, Allison um, finds something that takes the case in like a super weird direction. Um, she finds okay. taped to the back, <laughs> taped to the back of Ray's computer, a teeny tiny folded up note containing a message. Okay. According to Marie Claire, I know, I don't know. They wrote a good write up of the story, so that's where I went. All right. According, <laughs> according, why not? Um, according to Marie Claire, Allison says she knows he wrote the note the day they, that he disappeared because there were scraps in the trash can to indicate that this had just been written or typed out. Sure. Okay. The, the font was like shrunk down to this like super tiny size. Um, and the entire note was contained on a single piece of paper that had been folded. So it was seven inches long, a piece of paper, and then folded really tiny and taped behind his laptop or his computer in like a really hard to see spot. So like this was definitely mysterious already yes the note begins brothers and sisters right now around the world volcanoes are erupting what an awesome sight whom virtue unites death will not separate so that's the beginning of the note and uh she's like what there's more the fuck there's a lot more and uh that last line is apparently a masonic phrase um Uh, okay so that's that was the first thing she kind of figured out. And apparently in the days and weeks leading up to his death, Ray had expressed an interest in joining his local chapter of the Freemasons. And actually, the day he disappeared, he had bought the book Freemasons for Dummies. So mm-hmm. it did kind of fit that he was quoting the Masons, but also the note itself just becomes even weirder and wilder. I mean, this is kind of like a like a throwaway question that's not really important, but why were they how did they find this note behind his computer? Were they like just trying to like take everything out of his office? So Allison found it. So she was like digging through their stuff and trying to find any clue about like whether he, she was just trying to find like what the hell is going on. And I guess she moved his laptop or looked behind his computer and found it taped to the back of his computer. So she was looking. Yeah. She was like digging around for anything she could find. Um, Okay. And, So according to the Baltimore Police Department commander, Fred Bielfeld, quote, based on what we've seen, his interest in the Masonic order was not to do charitable work. Somehow it was linked to his interest in the movie industry and this theory that there was control being exerted by the Masonic order. Hmm. So the Maryland Lodge member who spoke with Rivera told Eleven News there was nothing unusual about the conversation that they had had. Um, he, He described it as typical of someone who wanted to learn about becoming a member. And uh, the note was the rest of the note was written in this sort of strange stream of consciousness style. Um, It began and ended with Freemasons quotes. And then according to Newsweek, other excerpts included, quote, I'd like to welcome those who accepted our invert. I'm sorry, our invitations for membership during the game. We couldn't have done it without you. I took on the endeavor to find the truth, but not for its own sake. In accepting this quest for the truth, I hope to make myself, with the help of others, into a man worthy and ready to receive it. And finally, it said, Members of the council, please note that I will lend careful concentration to the traditional responsibilities. In light of those proceedings, I will satisfy the standard request of this council within the appropriate time. And it just, like, made no sense to anybody, uh, including the Masonic guy was like, I don't know what he's talking about. 
Um, wow. Okay. Really strange. The note also listed several people that he knew, although it was a little weird. He left out some of his like closest friends and family, but he listed as many people as he could think of. Um, and he made a request in the note to make his friends five years younger. Uh, whatever that means. He also wrote out a list of movies, books, and music he found inspiring, including Meet Joe Black, Minority Report, The Born Identity, and Lord of the Rings. He also referenced film directors Stanley Kubrick, M. Night Shyamalan, as well as actor Christopher Reeve, who had died a year earlier. So it's like all over the place <laughs> and like That's, nonsensical. I mean, I like how the police wanted like just one thing to go off of, and now they've got just too <laughs> yeah, exactly. much. <laughs> like, exactly. I don't They're know like, what this to is. Do. Now there's like 400 doors open all of a sudden of possible routes. <laughs> right. And all of them make less sense than the previous one. Exactly. Like they're just, it's just like a jumble of nonsense. And Allison herself was like, I'm turning this in. So she turned this into the police. They turn it into the FBI. And the FBI actually looks at it, analyzes it, and says they do not consider this a suicide note. They were like, based on the way this is written, this is not a suicide note. And that is not what he was intending with this letter. So just another odd point. Um, his brother, Angel, for what it's worth, thinks this is a red herring and is like, I don't know what it is, but I don't think it necessarily has to do with his death. Um, so that's possible, too. But it is just a really weird coincidence that Allison found this and it had been written like right before he died. I Interesting. I know that the only thing I know about Freemasons is like to to join the to join the next level or to get higher up or even to join it all. Like your first big thing is you have to memorize a shitload of scripture. So like it would make sense if like, like Freemason scripture, like I, like I know that they have like books and it's basically like their version, not literally like a religious Bible, but it's like their, I don't know, their guidebook or their, the Freemason book. And you have to memorize like, hours of scripture or something like that so oh we maybe he was that maybe he kept it by his computer like just to like to memorize it and if he couldn't remember it he could like open it up and like read through it or something i like don't the like as like a mean? study guide what's that like the note you mean yeah like the notes spe- i'm just thinking about the note specifically but maybe like he but there was only two lines. Like there were only two lines that actually had to do with the Freemasons, and then the rest is just like lists of movies and actors. And oh, I thought those were in my head. Those were separate notes, and one of them was just like all about the Freemasons. Okay, I understand. No, so the note began and ended with Freemasons quotes, and then everything else was just like random ramblings all over the place um, about like his friends and family and um, volcanoes and mm, just okay. like weird stuff that made no sense whatsoever. Um, my idea then. <laughs> I was trying, <laughs> I was trying so hard. I was like, maybe that's it. I mean, maybe, but maybe it was some like uh, no mnemonic so, device no. where like Christopher Reeve stands for like a Freemason quote. Oh, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> I don't maybe know. Minority Report and Lord of the Rings are like his favorite <laughs> Freemasons. I don't know. <laughs> I know it's very strange. I mean, the only thing I know about the Freemasons is that they do not welcome women. So I was like, fuck you guys. Um, Mm. so I don't really know what the hell this was about. And Allison had no clue either, which I think is telling. Um, so obviously this is like extremely alarming. Um, Ray was known to scribble random thoughts onto pieces of paper, but this was different. Like Allison was like, it was never like this and he never like hid them out of view. So that was a little weird. Um, the FBI actually said it's not a suicide note, but it may be a code. So that was kind of creepy. But to this day, nobody has been able to decode it. So if you guys want to try your hand at it, you can look it up and see. Um, Good luck to you because it's really confusing. Um, Also, I will say that like there, since the Unsolved episode aired, there have been a couple more theories put out there by viewers of the show. And there's this one user named Zuma Light Blue who wrote, I am watching the Ray Rivera episode on Netflix, and what really caught my eye was the note Ray wrote on the day he died and he and hid the note behind the computer. It had all these names of actors, his friends and family, quotes from the Freemasons, and a list of movies. One of these movies was The Game. Immediately, I thought, of course, there is one big scene at the end of the movie where the main character jumped off the roof of a fancy hotel and goes through a glass roof. The similarities to Ray are truly astonishing. The whole movie is about this crazy game that makes you think you lose everything in order to let you appreciate life again. 
Ray was an unsuccessful movie scriptwriter, and maybe he got involved in something that tried to imitate the game in some way. So that's just one user's theory of like, maybe that's a connection. Um, I see. Who knows? Uh, it's still kind of out there, in my opinion. But it is an interesting like pull, I guess. Yeah. Um. Again, what I like I said, Angel thinks it might just be a red herring, but there are other weird inconsistencies um, that kind of don't add up. So, for example, no one at the hotel saw Ray the night he was killed. And like the hotel is now condos, but it does have like a, a bar and a nightclub kind of right where where this secret room was or this like blocked off room. And not one person saw him that evening, which is a little strange. And although the hotel cameras are fully option or operational, the footage from that night specifically was accidentally lost because the cameras malfunctioned. So I know that happens, but it's just a really weird timing that they seem to work yeah, every other very day. Convenient. And, yeah, very convenient. So another strange thing. Then there's the fact that before Ray's disappearance, Allison noted that he had started to act pretty strange. So he seemed unsettled or worried and like paranoid almost, but nobody really knew why. So according to um, that same Reddit user, Peanut Baron, in the weeks leading up to Ray's death, his wife, Allison, stated that Ray had become much more protective of her, often insisting on accompanying her wherever she went. Um, so this is a quote from Stephen Janis, who's a reporter and host of a podcast um, that I listened to called The Land of the Unsolved, who did a story on this. So Stephen says, in the spring of 2006, the couple visited Los Angeles to plan their move back. But when they returned to Baltimore, Ray began behaving oddly. Allison recalls he was edgy and nervous, uncharacteristic behavior for her usually self-assured husband. It started then, Allison said. He started going everywhere with me. He wouldn't let me do anything alone. A week before he disappeared, Ray accompanied his wife to a running track. Whilst there, something spooky happened. Allison recalled, as she jogged and Ray sat in the bleachers reading a book, a man appeared. <coughs> her husband, Sorry. she recalled, oh, you're fine. Uh, her husband, she recalls, freaked out. Even though the mysterious interloper left without incident, Allison says Ray seemed unnerved. It was not like him. So... That's just one example of kind of him being super paranoid. Um, and as if, as if that's not creepy enough, a few days later, the couple woke up, like a few days after this mysterious guy appeared and Ray freaked out, um, the couple woke up to the sound of their alarm system going off in the middle of the night. And Allison, okay. I know, it's just so much weirdness happening all at once. Um, Allison explained, it was 1 a.m. Ray came flying out with this big bat and this fear in his eyes that scared me to death. Someone was trying to get in the house. I believe it was connected to his death. Um, <sighs> creepy. Police determined it was a false alarm and that a squirrel had probably tripped it. That was their theory. Okay. But the next night, the alarm went off again around the same time. And Ray acted just as terrified, if not more so. Allison went and checked herself and noticed that one of the downstairs windows looked as though it had been tampered with and like the screen had been removed and it looked like the window was trying to be opened. I see. Um, okay. And the police just said they think it's a squirrel. So it's okay. just a weird, well. I don't, I don't think it's a squirrel two nights in a row at the same window, right. but whatever. Um, and finally, there's the freaking phone call that he got the day of his disappearance that like nobody knows what the hell was said that made him yell oh shit and run into the car right and take off um so what they do what they did figure out is that the call was made from stansbury associates from the place where he worked and they were able to figure out that it came from the company's switchboard um but there is no way to figure out who at the company made the call so that's just another weird uh it'd be weird, weird to be at that company and like be looking around wondering who it was who, who did it right yeah well the company comes back too i'll tell you in a second but um so porter who was the friend who owned this company and had convinced him to move out to baltimore um he had initially like i said put up a thousand dollar reward and got the media involved but as soon as attention turned toward his business he completely zipped up he refused to cooperate he went as far as to put a gag order on all the company's employees forbidding them from speaking to police or giving any interviews whatsoever um, and Michael Bayer, a detective with the police department at the time said, Ray's best friend, Porter Stansberry would not even return our calls, would not talk to us, would not give us any answers. So to me, that's really suspicious. Hmm. And it is strange because at the beginning he was like really worried and, you know, was like getting the media involved. And then all of a sudden the second they bring his company in and said like, Hey, this phone call came from your company. 
he completely shut down and like blocked all access to the company and refused to part, uh, you know, cooperate anymore. Gotcha. Um, so according to an entertainment site called CheatSheet.com, besides the gag order, the company was in trouble with the SEC over financial advice dispensed to investors. And Ray had actually joined the firm about a year after this huge legal issue that had happened. Um, some viewers mm. of the Unsolved episode think Stansberry had something to do with Rivera's death, either directly or indirectly. Like maybe he knew something that he wasn't supposed to know um, uh. and got into trouble for it or had to be killed for it. Um, and some people think maybe he was killed at the office, like maybe he was called into the office and then killed there and then put in the hotel um, to make it look like a suicide. So those are kind of just the uh, the theories, I guess. Um, another theory is that uh, people have considered the possibility that Rivera was killed by members of the Russian mob. So I know that sounds crazy, but apparently... Uh, this company, Stansberry, had a major connection to Russia, um, and this ha- also had to do with the huge trouble they were in with the SEC and like a lot of legal issues, and they were associated with some shady characters out of Russia. Um, and so that just seemed like another weird angle that nobody had looked at yet. Um, hmm. So, but but ba Oh yeah. So for like for example, the SEC complaint that had happened um, mentioned false insider trading involving specifically a Russian corporation. So just a little bit of shadiness there. Um, some I people mean, think I, I it feels very mobby in that like th- the one thing only, but that like his chins were broken in a way that doesn't yeah. make sense with his with yeah. potential suicide. So. That's yeah, you did say that in the beginning and I was like, I don't know how to explain the mob yet without <laughs> jumping gotcha, really yeah. far ahead. But yeah, yeah I mean, that it. was a weird, a weird thing. And the fact that his belongings were then found just like perfectly intact above. Yeah, but we're going to call it an accident. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so this is strange. But again, like even that like 45 foot jump, like, again, that would still have to have somebody throw him that far, which sounds just right. as difficult, if not more so. Um so it's it's just very confusing. Um, so some people actually think Porter, the best friend, is involved. Um, and maybe he was even the target and uh, kind of got out of the way and put uh, Ray in his place. Um, so, like, for example, they've noted how insistent Porter was that Ray come work for him over the years and, like, just insisting after this SEC issue, insisting that he come work for his company. But at the same time, like, they were best friends, so... Maybe they just wanted to work together, you know. Yeah, that and makes maybe sense to Ray me. Just needed a job, so I don't think that's super fishy or anything. Um, obviously, one of the main prevalent theories that we cannot ignore is that Ray's death was the result of an undiagnosed mental illness that was showing itself in the paranoia that he experienced in the note he had written um, that was pretty nonsensical. Um, what is weird and kind of sad that one Reddit user pointed out is that if this was just paranoia that had to do with mental illness. Um, the fact that his alarms were going off in the middle of the night and stuff is just would have been such a terrible coincidence, like, yeah, triggering his paranoia even more if it really was a squirrel, say, like, totally perpetuating that everything he's believing exactly. is, is tr- real. Exactly. And so the timing of it is really weird. So it's obviously possible that that's a coincidence, but it just kind of doesn't add up completely. Um, as for Allison, she still doesn't have the answers she's seeking, sadly, but she does hope somebody, especially now with the episode that's out, uh, comes forward. She says, I kept saying there's something bigger, there's something more going on. I think he turned over some rock and he shouldn't have turned it over, but I know he didn't kill himself. My hope is that there is somebody out there who knows the truth. So anybody who does have tips um, is asked to submit them at unsolved.com. But uh, for now, this remains an unsolved mystery. The death of Re- Ray Rivera. Wow. The end. <clears throat> you did a good job on that. Oh, thank you. I feel like I was talking so fast. Sorry. No, I I I haven't watched Unsolved Mysteries yet, and I know a lot of people are going to scream at me about that, but um, no, I haven't watched it yet. So now I'm excited to actually watch the show and be like, I know what's coming. And also, <laughs> I, can under, I can maybe look at that note and see what weird i i'm trying to think like i've made some weird fucking notes at two in the morning right so like maybe there's someone out there who has some sort of understanding but if no one has by now i don't think i'm gonna be the one to crack it but it'll be fun to try 
I mean, who knows? We have we have some smart listeners, so uh, certainly we're not going to figure it out, but maybe one of you will. Um, but yeah, and the fact that he hid it behind his computer is really sc- like folded it up really small. It's not like it was just on his bedside; like he had a weird dream or something. It was like hidden, right. which is kind of weird. But you're right; like it was a I, sneaky intention. Yeah, it wasn't meant to be found, which is also kind of weird. So mm. anyway, that's my story, um, and thank you everybody for s- listening. Well, I I mean, yeah, thank you. Uh, very juicy. And if you haven't watched Unsolved Mysteries yet, I plan to. So you know, check it out. Check it out. All right. Well, uh, thank you for listening. We, I mean, check us out on and that's why we drink.com and submit your listener stories there if you'd like to. Um, you can also uh, find us on our social media at ATWWD Podcast, our Patreon at ATWWD Podcast, our personals, uh, the M. Schultz and X Teen Chiefer. And that's it. And that's <laughs> why we drink. Yay. Oh, <laughs>